Hello and welcome to Clash of the Dice. I'm James and welcome back to our Path to Glory campaign. This is episode 2. In the previous episode you saw Rich's Hedda Knights of Slanesh warband going up against Joshua's Skaven warband. And in this episode you'll be seeing my Trogoth herd going up against Rich's Hedda Knights of Slanesh. If you haven't seen episode 1 yet, please do go and check it out. As with the previous game, the format of this battle report is going to be a slideshow with me talking over the top of it, what I like to call a podcast style. And with no further ado, let's introduce you to my trog herd. This is Brug's herd. It's obviously a trog herd from the Gloomspike Gits faction, and that is the battle formation that we're using, a trog herd. So after every unit has fought, it can heal D3 damage that's been allocated to it to restore D3 health after each time it fights. And that's in addition to its natural regeneration abilities that each Trogoth unit has. This particular Trog herd originates from the realm of Gur, and is headed up by our hero, Boss Brug. He's the brown-coloured Trog boss in the middle of the screen. As Kragnos rampaged across the realm of Gur, a calling of power went out across the mortal realms, drawing elements of forces of destruction towards the realm of Gur, including Trogoths from all of the different realms. And by the time the Siege of Excelsis was over, some Trogoths from all over the Mortal Realms had only just made it to the Realm of Gur. And as the excitement and the energy dissipated, the Trogoths began to slink back into the caves and dank holds across Gur. And that's indeed what Boss Brug did. He descended through the caves and the underground into the dank holds, where he went into hibernation. Time passed, epochs passed, who knows how long, until he felt a stirring within him. And he arose and he ascended back through the various levels from the Dankolds up into the lower caves and finally out into the moonlight of the Bad Moon. And following in his wake were other Trogoths who had descended into the various cave systems behind him. And now they are hungry. So this is the warlord of my warband, Boss Brug. He is a Dankold Trog boss and for enhancements he has the Clammy Hand as his command trait, which allows him to roll three extra dice when he does a rally, when he tries to rally a unit. Uh, so instead of rolling six dice, he rolls nine dice, and for each four plus you get a rally point. And his artifact of power is the Clammy Cowl, which makes him minus one to hit for all attacks that target him. Boss Brug is following the path of the warrior, and because he's my warlord, he already has the rank of aspiring, so the ability that he has unlocked is he's a berserker, which means he can re-roll charge rolls. The other units in the warband are all named from Boss Brug's perspective. Now remember that Trogoths aren't exactly renowned for their intelligence or imagination. For example, this is another Dankhold Trog boss within the warband. This is Big Trog because Boss Brug looks at him, realises he's a bigger trog than the other trog, so he's just simply called him Big Trog. And as you may be able to tell from the colouring, I hope you can tell from the colouring, I've tried to colour all of my trogs to depict a particular realm that they come from. Big Trog comes from the realm of Gyran, hence the green hues in his skin. Likewise, this unit of Fellwater Trogoths also come from the realm of Gyran. They are simply called the Stinky Trogs, because they stink. And as you can probably tell, the six of them, this is indeed a reinforced unit of Fellwater Trogoths. And finally, we have a unit of Rockgut Trogoths, simply called the Rocky Trogs, by Boss Brug. And they are just a regular unit of Rockgut Trogoths, and they come from Gur. Now, I'll be honest, this is the oldest unit in the army in terms of when I painted them, and I basically went for box art when I originally painted these. Uh, but I've decided that because they're box art, they're a destruction faction unit, so logically they come from Gur, hence this unit comes from Gur. I'm currently in the process of painting some more, and they're going to be from Akshi, so they're going to be sort of orange and black to represent magma. But right now, these are the ones I've got, they're from Gur, the Rocky Chogs. And that totals 970 points out of my starting allotment of 1,000 points, so I've got 30 points to spend later on in the campaign, which I can obviously add to as the campaign progresses. Now, you're probably wondering, how come I'm using a Destruction Faction where Rich and Joshua are both using Chaos? Now, originally, I was going to do a Slaves to Darkness army for Path to Glory, but I was already having to paint a Skaven army pretty much from scratch for Joshua. I didn't fancy having to paint an entire army for myself from scratch as well. I could have used my Maggot Kin of Nurgle, but I just wanted to paint my Trogs, because they looked cool, and 
I've actually ended up almost painting an entire army of trogs just for this game, but they're a lot easier to paint than Slaves of Darkness are. Either way, I'm painting trogs. Rich thinks they're great. Joshua absolutely hates them, and I think they're really cool and fun. Plus, their faction rules are really simple. It's Light of the Bad Moon. If they're under the Light of the Bad Moon, they get plus one to the save rolls. Nice and simple. Don't have to remember much. Just to quickly recap for Rich's Head and Knights of Slanesh warband, the Warlord is a Lord of Pain called Dorian Derren. He also has a unit of Simbarash Twin Souls, a unit of Slangor Fiend Bloods, a unit of Slickblade Seekers, a Contorted Epitome, and a unit of Fiends. And for the Endless Spells, he's chosen the dreadful visage. If you want to know all of the details around all of the artifacts and enhancements and things like that that is chosen, please go and check out episode one rather than me repeating it all here. Uh, the army is pretty much unchanged from the first episode. To go through the scenario we're playing out in this game, fresh off their success, spoiler alert, from the previous game, the Hedda Knights of Slanesh find themselves ambushed by the hungry trog herd. So we are playing the ambush scenario from the Path to Glory Battle Pack from the 4th edition core rulebook. Ridge's header knights are the trespassers and my trogs are the ambushers. The trespassers deploy in the area shaded in blue on the screen and their objective is to escape off the eastern table edge. They score D3 victory points for each unit that they get to within 3 inches of the escape route table edge and that are not in combat, they can then elect to have those units escape and they score D3 victory points. The ambushers, aka my trogoths, can deploy anywhere else on the table as long as they are not within 6 inches of the trespassers territory. Now bearing in mind the trespassers are trying to get off the eastern table edge, I'm not entirely sure why the ambusher would want to deploy any units in this area here to the left of the trespassers territory. I suppose if you had some really fast units or some really good ranged units that could gun them down or run them down as they progressed off the table then you could possibly do that but for me I just elected to form a solid wall of Trogoth muscle that the head knights either had to try and run through or around. The ambushers score victory points for destroying units. They gain one victory point for every 100 points full 100 points that a unit costs and the example given in the rulebook specifically says that if you destroy a unit that costs 390 points you only get three victory points so it's one victory point for every full hundred points that the unit is worth the rules also say that the ambusher cannot set up faction terrain during the deployment phase so the head knights can set up their faction terrain piece so somehow whilst they're tra traipsing along They've managed to set up this profane icon to Slanesh. Maybe they've stopped to make camp, but I can't set up my Loon Shrine for my Trogoths. I should also say that I got Joshua to set up the terrain for this particular table, given how much he complained about the setup that we had for the game that he played against Rich. So Joshua was supposedly impartial uh, on the basis that Rich beat him, and he hates my Trogoths, so he despises us both equally, so he set up the table, not me. Moving on to deployment, like I say, I basically deployed a solid wall of Trogoth across the battlefield that Rich would either have to try and get through or around. There were some gaps, but uh, yeah, other than that, it was basically a solid wall of Trogoth. So on my right flank, I deployed Big Trog, and next to him, towards the centre, I deployed Distinky Trogs. And then I deployed the Rocky Trogs, and then finally, over on the left flank, Boss Brug. Rich deployed his Fane of Slanesh terrain piece, more or less in the middle of his territory, slightly to the south of centre. On his left flank, Rich deployed his Seekers, and he deployed the Twin Souls in front of the Fane, supported by the Lord of Pain. From the centre, out towards the right flank, he deployed the Slangors, then the Contorted Epitome, and right on the right-hand flank, he deployed the Fiends. At the start of the first battle round, I decided that the Bad Moon would be shining its light into the northeast quarter of the battlefield, where it would be shining its light down onto Big Trog and the Stinky Trogs, so giving them plus one to their save rolls or any other unit that's a Trogoth unit that happened to stray into that quarter. 
Rich selected three units to be euphoric and accordingly gave me three temptation dice. Now then, the rules for the scenario specifically state that the ambusher, i.e. my trogs, take the first turn of the battle, but there is no movement phase in the ambusher's first turn. So, I did indeed use my temptation dice because whilst there's no movement phase, I could get a charge in. I was close enough, I was just within 12 inches to get a charge in, so I used two of the temptation dice to get an automatic 12. I would say this was actually Richard's suggestion. I thought, yeah, why not? So Boss Brug went charging into the fiends in the charge phase and then took some mortal damage from the temptation dice. And I was quite happy to risk that because I knew full well that Boss Brug would get to fight first and because he's in a trog herd, he would heal after he fights. And Brug did indeed take two mortal damage from the temptation dice. I gave Boss Brug all out attack and then I rolled for his Shepherd of Destruction ability, which is a standard Dankhold Trog Boss ability built into the War Scroll. You roll a dice and on a 3 plus for the rest of the turn, add one to the attack's characteristic of melee weapons used by friendly Trogoth units while they're within this unit's combat range. He's within range of himself, I rolled a 5, so his attack's characteristics for his Boulder Club went from 5 to 6. I scored 4 out of 6 hits, which is statistically average when you're hitting on 3s, and I would have been winning on 2s, so I rolled 4 wind rolls. And if you look on the screen, if you're currently painting, you will see a pretty standard James Bat Rep dice roll. Of the 4 dice, 3 of them were 1s. Thankfully, Rich did fail his save roll for that, but with ward rolls, one of the fiends ended up just taking 2 damage. So whilst I hadn't inflicted as much damage as I would have wanted to, I did, however, manage to fully heal Boss Brug from his Trog Herd ability after he fought. Those two damage that he took from the Temptation dice were taken away by his healing. Rich fought back with the Fiends, and it turns out that in the transition from 3rd edition to 4th edition, Dankhold Trogoths and Dankhold Trog Bosses are now monsters. In 3rd edition they weren't, they didn't have the monster keyword, but in 4th edition they have the monster keyword. It also turns out fiends get an extra pip of rend against monsters, and they managed to inflict 5 damage onto Boss Brug. That was the end of my turn. It didn't go quite as well as I would have hoped. I would have hoped to have done a bit more damage to those fiends, but hey ho, that's the dice, that's why we roll them. At the start of Rich's turn, I used Boss Brug's Greater Regeneration ability to heal two health back onto him. Grimhilda and Shalot, aka Rich's Contorted Epitome, elected to make a sacrifice to the Fane of Slanesh, and thereby get plus one to their casting rolls for their spells. In doing so, they took two mortal damage. This paid off to some degree, because they were then able to summon in the Dreadful Visage Endless Spell. And they managed to do it first time, whereas in the first game it took him three attempts to summon it in. This time he got it in straight away, and he did it with a roll of 8+, plus, which meant he gets an extra quest point for his quest. In the movement phase, the Seekers made a run down the left flank, adding an extra two inches to their move from the run action. In the centre, the Lord of Pain made a regular move. The Twin Souls made a run because they are euphoric so they can run and still charge, but they only got an extra one inch worth of move out of it. The Slangors moved up ever so slightly, but whilst they could have moved through the manifestation, they just decided to hug the terrain feature for now. In the charge phase, Rich had quite a few failed slash poor charge rolls. The Lord of Pain failed to charge into either Big Trog or Distinky Trogs, even with a re-roll. The Twin Souls, they made a charge roll, but it wasn't quite long enough for them to be able to get into either Big Trog or the Stinky Trogs either, so they had to charge into the Rock Trogs instead. However, that meant that because of the failed charges or the poor charges, the Seekers had to charge into the Fellwaters to try and do a bit of damage to them. Otherwise, he simply risked my Fellwaters countercharging and blocking them completely with the terrain piece. Likewise, the Dreadful Visage also failed the charge. The Contorted Epitome succeeded in charging Boss Brug, but not with a sufficient charge that would then have left space for the Slangors to also make it into combat with Boss Brug. At the start of the combat phase, I tried to use my Shepherd of Destruction ability again, but I rolled a 1 on my 3 plus attempt. The Seekers started off the combat phase, and they succeeded in allocating 8 damage against Big Trog. 
it might be worth explaining that Big Trog can't also use the Shepherd of Destruction ability because you can only use that once per army per phase. So as Boss Brug had already tried to use it, Big Trog couldn't use it as well. Boss Brug fought next, and through some incredibly lucky save rolls, those fiends were saving on sixes, and some incredibly lucky ward rolls, those fiends had a ward of six plus, I managed to inflict one more damage on one of the fiends. However, after he had fought, Boss Brug was able to heal back all of the damage that he had previously suffered. Just going to quickly gloss over the remaining combats. In the return attacks from the Fiends and also the Contorted Epitome, Bosbrug took a further 8 damage. But on the other side of the battlefield, the Fellwater Trogoths laid into the Seekers and managed to kill off 3 of them, and then finally Big Trog managed to kill off the remaining 2 Seekers, and also managed to heal himself of 3 damage in the process. At the end of the battle round I scored 1 point for destroying the Seekers, they're a 180 point unit but as I said it's only 1 point for every full 100 points of the unit's cost, so 180 points means I get 1 victory point. So at the end of battle round 1 it's 1 point to the Trogoths and 0 points to the Hedonites of Slanesh. I won the priority roll off for the second battle round and then proceeded to do quite a lot of healing for all of my Trogoth units with their regeneration abilities. Big Trog, being a dank old Trog boss, heals d6 and I rolled a 5, taking away the 5 damage that he had suffered so far. I've just realised that I didn't cover off the combat between the Rock Trogoths and the Twin Souls in the previous battle round, so I'll quickly go over it now. The Rock Trogoths managed to take down 3 of the Twin Souls and suffered 3 damage in return. Back to the present. The Rotchogoths healed D3, and they did indeed heal the 3 points of damage that they had suffered. And finally, Bosbrug healed 2 damage out of the 8 that he'd suffered in the previous turn. Now, I'm not going to feel too bad about all that regeneration, because when I first started playing against Rich in 3rd edition, he was using Soulblight Gravelords, and he was running vampires that were almost impossible to kill. So, this is a little bit of revenge, mwahaha. And finally, for start of battle round things that happen, the Bad Moon decided to move to the centre of the table, thereby illuminating the entire table. So all of the Trogoth units, regardless of where they are on the table, will be getting plus one to their save rolls. In the movement phase, Big Trog headed towards the Lord of Pain, and the Stinky Trogs turned and started heading towards the remaining Twin Souls. Moving into the shooting phase, we checked and rechecked the rules for picking targets because I was under the impression that you can't shoot into an ongoing combat unless you were part of that combat and your missile weapons specifically allow you to shoot in combat in 4th edition. So we read and reread the rules and the shooting attacks on page 208 of the core book under section 16 says shooting attacks are made with ranged weapons the target units must be within a distance equal to the range characteristic of the weapon being used and visible to the attacking model models cannot make shooting attacks if their unit is in combat unless otherwise specified now the fellwater trogoths were not in that combat and even if they were they are allowed to shoot into combat because their noxious vomit missile weapon does specifically say they can shoot in combat so we've interpreted it to say that if you're not in a combat you can still shoot into it so please correct us if you think that there's anything that's come up that has negated that certainly in third edition you could shoot into an ongoing combat so in fourth edition we think you can shoot into an ongoing combat unless you're part of that combat and your ranged weapon doesn't specifically say that you can short version Trogoths vomited onto Twin Souls and wiped them out. In the charge phase, the Rocky Trogs managed to charge the Contorted Epitome, and Big Trog and the Stinky Trogs both managed to charge the Lord of Pain. Boss Brug tried to use his Shepherd of Destruction ability again, but rolled another one. Boss Brug fought first, and managed to finally kill off one of the fiends and allocate two damage to another one of them, and then managed to heal two damage off himself. Dorian, the Lord of Pain, fought next and fought against the Fellwater Trogoths. He managed to inflict 4 damage onto one of the Fellwaters. Fellwater Trogoths are now 5 health. In 3rd edition, they were only 4 health, so didn't quite manage to finish off any of the Trogoths yet. 
The Rockgut Trogos fought next against the Contorted Epitome and managed to inflict 4 more damage onto it. 7 health, 6 taken, 1 health left. Very annoying. Next the Fiends fought and managed to take down Boss Brug. Big Trog fought next against the Lord of Pain and managed to inflict 2 damage onto it with ward rolls. Again, as per the first game, if the Lord of Pain makes a successful ward roll, then it inflicts mortal damage back onto the attacker. Big Trog took 4 mortal damage in return, but then managed to regenerate one of those damage points. The Contorted Epitome fought against the Rockgut Trogoths, but did no damage. Finally, the Stinky Trogs fought against Dorian, the Lord of Pain, and managed to kill him off, but not without losing one of their number to return mortal damage from successful ward rolls. That was the end of my turn and I managed to score two more victory points, one for killing off the Lord of Pain and one for killing off the Twin Souls. At the start of Richard's turn, Big Trog managed to do some more healing and got him down to just one health having been taken. The Slangors made a sacrifice to the Fane of Slanesh to get plus one to their run and charge rolls but in doing so took three mortal damage. In the movement phase, with the Contorted Epitome being tied up in combat with the Rocket Trogoths, the Fiends and the Slangors both ran around the terrain piece and then Rich used the Dreadful Visage to effectively form a barrier between the Fellwater Trogoths and his own troops. In the shooting phase, I used the command point for covering fire, having seen how well Joshua used it in his game with his Warplock Gisales. The Fellwater Trogoth vomited onto the Dreadful Visage, but only managed to inflict one point of damage. In the combat phase, the Contorted Epitome fought against the Rocky Trogs and managed to inflict one point of damage. The Rocky Trogs fought back and managed to finish off Dorian's Demonic Advisors. The Contorted Epitome is worth a nice round 200 points, giving me another two victory points making it 5 points to the Trogoths at the end of Battle Round 2 and still 0 points to the Head of Knights of Slanesh. Very often when Rich and I play, there comes a point in the game where the priority role will basically determine who wins or loses. And this was one of those situations. Rich really needed to win this priority role off, but unfortunately for him, he didn't. The Bad Moon elected to stay in the centre of the battlefield just to make things worse for him. And we finally remembered that there's such a thing as a twist table and Rich was definitely the underdog by this point. Uh, so the twist he rolled was he had allocate fight first to one of his units and he allocated that to his fiends. In the movement phase, the Rockgut Trogoths moved to try and close in the Fiends and the Slangors, but obviously had to stay three inches away from them because of rules. And Big Trog and the Stinky Trogs managed to form a bit more of a line around the Dreadful Visage Endless Spell. And in response, Rich elected to spend a command point on Redeploy and got a really good roll, enabling his slangors to get close to the edge of the battlefield. Now we couldn't elect to then take them off because you can't take them off and try to score the victory points until the end of the turn but they were definitely within three inches of the edge of the battlefield after they completed their six inch move. In the shooting phase the rocky trogs threw some boulders at the fiends and managed to kill one of them and the stinky trogs then vomited onto the dreadful visage again and managed to remove it from the battlefield. The Rocky Trogs charged after the Slangors and rolled an 11, which managed to get them around, cutting them off from the edge of the battlefield. And then Big Trog and the Stinky Trogs charged into the last remaining Fiend. The last remaining Fiend had fight first as a result of the twist, and managed to inflict 8 damage onto Big Trog all by itself. Imagine what it would have been like if there had been more Fiends left. It probably would have taken down Big Trog. The Rocky Trogs fought next and managed to completely annihilate the Slangors. And then finally, the Stinky Trogs took down the last Fiend. That made the final score 7 points to the Trogs and 0 points to Slanesh. In essence, Rich really needed to have won the priority for that last battle round, got both of those units off the table and rolled 3 for both of his D3 to have won the game. But, as it happened, he didn't. Now these kind of escape slash run the gauntlet type scenarios are always really 
difficult from the point of view of the person who needs to get his models off the table. Uh, but what we have discovered is, and is unanimously agreed by myself, Rich and Joshua, in that particular scenario where Trogoths are the defenders, i.e. the ones trying to stop the people from escaping, Trogoths are crazy broken strong. So it's going to be interesting to see what they're going to be like in another kind of scenario, such as holding objectives, especially once the war bands get to a size where we're using bigger tables and the objectives are more spread out because Trogos aren't all that nippy. They've got a maximum move of six, but that remains to be seen. In the aftermath sequence, I managed to gain 50 glory points for playing a game of Path of Glory and winning a major victory. However, my warlord was slain during the battle, so I don't get an extra five for that. My favoured warriors for the game were the Rockgut Trogoths, because they managed to rush over to try and help Boss Brug. They didn't quite succeed, but they also then managed to make that big charge, cutting off the Slangors and preventing them from escaping. And that gave them a total of five renown, which promoted them to aspiring, and I put them on the path of the attacker. And their first ability is Battle Fury, which allows them to run and charge, making them a bit more nippy in the games, as I said. Rockgut Trogoths. Trogoths in general are quite restricted for movement wise. I also realised that I forgot to tell you which quest I was doing. I was doing the Seek Glory in Battle quest where you pick a unit and if you win a major or minor victory and they survive the battle they gain an extra d3 plus 3 renown and the unit I picked for that was my Fellwater Trogoths so they managed to get enough renown to also get onto the first level of aspiring on a particular path and I chose the same Battle Fury so they can now run in charge as well. Rich gained a total of 30 glory points for playing a Path to Glory battle and also managed to accrue a total of 7 renown. Amidst that was some extra renown for his favoured warriors and he picked his fiends and his fiends managed to get on the first level of their path. Again, they've chosen the path of the attacker and they have elected to go for full on attack, which gives them a once per battle plus one to hit for attacks. So that's the end of episode two of our Path to Glory campaign. Please join us in the next episode where my trog herd will be going up against Joshua's Skaven. In the meantime, please continue to like, comment and subscribe and God bless.